Welcome to this edition of our podcast series, NC Talks. To introduce myself, I'm Lauren Pulling, editor of Neurology Central, and today I'm very fortunate to be joined by Emery Brown, Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Brown has delivered a number of lectures in recent years on deciphering the dynamics of the brain under general anesthesia and how the potential of this area may currently be underutilised. In this podcast, we'll hear more about Dr. Brown's work and how general anaesthesia can be used to understand and develop new treatments for neurological and psychiatric conditions. And we'll also look ahead at the future of the field. So I hope you enjoy listening, and if you work in this area or if you have any comments for us, we'd love for you to get in touch. So first, please could you tell us a little about your background and what led you to become interested in general anaesthesia? Well, I am an anesthesiologist, and uh, in, in addition to being an anesthesiologist, I've had for a number of years a research program in statistics and in neuroscience. I'm also a statistician. And, um, y- you know, it became clear to me after a good period of practicing anesthesia but doing research in statistics that one of the questions that was not being looked at was really how does anesthesia work, at least not from a neuroscience perspective. And this is because of my work in neuroscience, you know, this is a perspective which I had developed. So I figured why not use the tools that my neuroscience colleagues were using to look at other questions to study the question of general anesthesia. It could be framed as a systems neuroscience question as well. Because in systems neuroscience, you put in a stimulus and you watch how the brain responds and you use that to figure out the particular mechanism of the brain circuits that you're interested in. So here, under anesthesia, you put in a very strong stimulus. It's an anesthetic drug. You have all sorts of things you can measure, like the electroencephalogram. You could do functional imaging. You could look at behavioral changes. And so from those, can you infer how the drugs are creating the anesthetic state. So realizing that, I decided that this would be a very fruitful area to pursue. Not not only fruitful, but also, you know, important because the the experimental paradigms were there. We just hadn't really applied them to anesthesia. So you recently delivered a clinical neuroscience lecture at Neuroscience 2016 uh, entitled Deciphering the Dynamics of the Unconscious Brain Under General Anesthesia. So general anesthesia is something that we're all aware of, but a lot of us uh, know very little about it. Could you first explain what general anesthesia is and how we think it works? Yes, so general anesthesia is a state, and it's what you might say, is a, is a reversible coma. Um, it's a drug-induced reversible coma, and, and you have to be in a coma in order to really tolerate, you know, the trauma of a surgical intervention or a, or an inventor, or a, or an invasive diagnostic proce- procedure. You have to be insensate, and that coma has like four kind of major behavioral characteristics. You're unconscious, you don't feel pain, you're not moving, that makes it easy for the surgeons to operate, and you form no memories of the time that you're under anesthesia. Then in addition to that, we maintain control of your physiologic systems, heart rate, blood pressure, you know, body temperature, you know, these sorts of things. So it's this state that we place you in because for surgery, you need to be rendered. You need to be rendered insensate. So, the first public demonstration of anesthesia took place. Pardon me, I'm getting over a cold here. It took place in 1846 at uh, Mass General Hospital, and it used ether, and and it revolutionized the practice of surgery. And we still use ethers today. And the one thing that we've come to appreciate is how do the drugs generate the various states of altered arousal that are necessary to place you in this drug-induced reversible coma? Well, the big thing that you can see when you give a patient anesthetic drugs, the big reproducible phenomenon that you see, is that the drugs cause oscillations in the brain, highly structured, organized oscillations that we now understand disrupt or impair the ability of different brain circuits to transmit information. As long as the drugs are there, 
the brain oscillates. These are in these oscillations. You, as I said, you can see them on the electroencephalogram. What they are, they're currents that are flowing in the brain that are being controlled by the anesthetic drugs, and they disrupt the normal brainwave patterns that you know you would have if you were just awake. And as a consequence of these interfering with the way the brain transmits information, you create these anesthetic states. When you turn the drugs off, these effects eventually resolve and the person, you know, comes to. So how do brain dynamics under general anesthesia change as a function of age and what other factors influence these dynamics? Well, so they, they change not only as a function of age, but they change as a function of the different drugs, too. So when you change the drug class, drugs in the, in the same class will generate very similar brain dynamics. So drugs which, just to give a, an example, one of the main inhibitory transmitters in the brain is GABA. So drugs which work primarily on the GABAergic circuits like propofol, etomidate, you know, the ethers like sevoflurane, desflurane, isoflurane, they will cause a certain pattern, which is a characteristic of that, of that drug class. Whereas if you change the drug class, if you use the opioids or you use, um, let's say, dexmedetomidine, which is another drug, another class of anesthetic drugs, you'll see a different pattern. So the first thing to understand is that the, the, the patterns on the EEG change systematically with drug class. Then they also change systematically with age. And this is because, you know, simply stated, it's because as you get older, the, the nerve cells in the brain age. So their ability to produce these oscillations or to respond in an oscillatory dynamics, you know, to respond to the oscillatory, excuse me, to respond to the induction of these oscillatory dynamics changes as well. So, you know, you have, what, 10 to the 10 neurons, and these neurons get older with time. And what we see is that the oscillations have much larger amplitudes, let's say in younger children, and they reach their sort of largest amplitude when kids are about six to eight years of age, and they decline from there on down through, uh, you know, through, adult, through puberty, adolescence, through adulthood, you know, on into, you know, into old age. And this is just because the ability of the neurons to respond to the or, or to respond to the drugs the same way just changes with age. So in your lecture you highlighted how we now know a lot about general anesthesia but uh, the, the knowledge and the tools that this could bring us are being underutilized. So how could it be used to further understand the workings of the brain both from a research and clinical perspective? I think, there, I think there are two ways of thinking about it. So let's do the practical one first. So the practical one is in the OR, taking care of a patient that's having surgery and requires general anesthesia. So there, by understanding how the brain dynamics change as a function of drug, drug dose, and age, we can develop a very principled way to track the brain states of patients under anesthesia, making sure that patients have just the right amount of anesthesia, not too little, you know, not too much. Too little, you know, them being a risk, at risk for awareness, you know, too much, them being over-sedated maybe, you know, perhaps causing untowards effect on the brain, effects that, you know, we wouldn't like to see. So, that, so that's the first practical use just in the operating room, and I think that that's kind of like first and, and foremost. But then if you stand back from it, and as we've had to study uh, the brain circuits to decipher how, we, how, we, how we've come to appreciate that the drugs are working, it's a perspective on... It's a perspective on brain function that is not part of mainstream neuroscience. I mean, in fact, you don't usually think of the study of general anesthesia as part of neuroscience, even though the primary effect is in the central nervous system in the brain. You know, general anesthesia is viewed primarily as a, as a subdiscipline of, of pharmacology. So coming to appreciate that 
with anesthesia, you're actually affecting the brain. You're putting in a stimulus and you're looking at how the brain responds. We can gain like a lot of insights into basic mechanisms. So here, here's, I'll just give you a couple of concrete examples. Um, one of the things that you see in coma is, a, is an EEG pattern which is called burst suppression. And it's a state in which the brain is substantially shut down. Another situation which is produced is in kids with what this uh, infantile encephalitis called encephalopathy called Autohara syndrome. Their, their brains are hyperdeveloped. It also happens in people who are placed in hyperthermia. Okay. It also happens in deep states of general anesthesia. Now, it's interesting that it happens in general anesthesia because it's with a certain class of anesthetic drugs. So this phenomenon, so you have these three or four different processes which, when the brain is profoundly turned off, show this pattern of EEG action. The one way that you can produce it parametrically or in a systematic way is with anesthesia. So it suggests that anesthesia for this particular brain state could be a way of systematically studying you know, this very deep state of brain inactivation. And that's something which would not be which would not be as apparent, um, you know, you know, were we not, you know, studying anesthesia. I'll give you a second example. One of the things that we've been looking at, my colleague Ken Sult has been studying in detail, is why don't we turn the brain back on after anesthesia? All right. So this entails administering drugs that at the end of the case, once the person has, once the surgery is over, to administer a drug which can reactivate the brain. And hopefully this can be a way of helping the person, helping the patient come to quicker, but also maybe mitigating the, you know, the untoward side effects of brain dysfunction, which occurs in a high fraction of patients after anesthesia, particularly elderly patients. So as we've studied, you know, these circuits, you know, we've come to learn a lot, you know, Ken has been doing this by administering intravenous Ritalin, you know, the same Ritalin that's used to treat children with ADHD. Yeah. But it's, it's led us to a very detailed study of these circuits which, you know, where Ritalin acts, which are dopaminergic circuits which emanate from the midbrain and project up into the cortex and into uh, the limbic system. So again, this takes us into studying the, you know, very fundamental feature of the brain's arousal systems, beginning with a perspective that is not something that has been taken or adopted before. So our experiences are replete with, with cases like this. Take the drug ketamine, for example. Ketamine is used to treat pain. It's also used as a model for schizophrenia because it produces very profound hallucinations and the brain activity of you know of animals under ketamine looks very much like some of the brain patterns that you see in patients that are schizophrenic but more recently ketamine has been used in low doses to treat depression so these are things which you know we as anesthesiologists use on a day-to-day -day basis and you know we use them for their clinical benefits to help us take care of patients better in the operating room. But now if we study some of the features of these, in other words, why is it that this drug would allow you to feel better if you're depressed? And it's interesting, when you give low doses of ketamine, when it works, it works fairly quickly. I mean, fairly quickly means within an hour or so. And the effects can last as long as, you know, seven to ten days or maybe as long as two weeks. So, so in other words, anesthesia is a, is a field of clinical neuroscience which hasn't been treated as such. And I think taking more seriously all the things that we do in anesthesia, in anesthesiology, from a neuroscience perspective will allow us to learn a lot more about the brain from a perspective which, which as I said, which, you know, as you in, indicated in your question, has not been exploited to the extent that it, it should be. This is really interesting. And so to sort of follow on from that, how do you think uh, this knowledge could be used to further investigate and understand neurological and psychiatric conditions? Well, so again, 
like, again, with the case of schizophrenia, ketamine is a model for schizophrenia, administering it and looking at the dynamics. Yeah. Like, or, or as another illustration, <clears throat> in the case of, um, so, so look at it this way. Anesthesia is all about controlling. If you simplify it down to its essence, it's all about controlling, you know, your level of arousal in a very profound way so that, you know, you're able to tolerate an otherwise traumatic intervention, right? So, um, so in the simplest case, it's like you can think of it as turning the brain on or turning the brain off. Yeah. But, you know, if we move away, if we move further in and we say, okay, what we want to do is control your precise level of arousal, right? Mm. We want to have you just as sedated as you need to be. Or maybe you need to be a little bit more sedated for this particular procedure but not fully out under general anesthesia. So if you look at what that says, that says, can you put subtlety in the way that you control these arousal circuits? Now, if you map that onto what happens in a lot of neurological disorders, psychiatric disorders, take take a psychiatric disorder like, you know, depression. When you're depressed, you know, your level of arousal and your level of feeling good is not where it should be. So can we use some of these ideas from anesthesia or anesthesiology as we learn more about how the, how the drugs work and how these circuits work to produce more refined approaches which could contribute to that. Because we, you know, we're asked to do that as anesthesiologists, sort of turn the brain on, turn the brain off, have you a little sedated, a lot sedated. But can we use some of these paradigms in these other areas? See, the question, the question can now be posed before we, if you didn't think of anesthesiology as a neuroscience discipline, you wouldn't even pose the question. So um, do you think we could see a shift in how we use general anesthesia in the next five to ten years then? And how would you like to see the field progress in the future? Yeah, I think we can. I think we can make... uh I think we can make tremendous progress. I think the first thing that we should do, as I suggest, is use the EEG to monitor the brain states of patients under anesthesia. I think that will help us dose the drugs in a much more principled manner and be able to um, reduce the likelihood of overdose and reduce the likelihood of underdosing and awareness. I think that that's something which we can do now. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, the patient population with which we should begin as soon as possible are the elderly because the epidemiologic studies suggest that they're the greatest at risk for having brain dysfunction after anesthesia. And um, and, and you know, so the, the figures can be, depending on what study you look at, 20 to 40 percent of patients, you know, 60 years of age or older will have some sort of brain dysfunction after anesthesia, which could last for just a few hours up to several days or months. So I think that's something very concrete that we can do. I think developing further this idea of kin salts, of turning the brain back on after anesthesia, um, it's not surprising when you see the oscillations that I mentioned to you that the anesthetics generate. They're not natural. They're, they're, They're pathologic in the sense that there's something that the brain is being induced to do by drugs that it wouldn't naturally do. And so once you appreciate that, then realizing that after you turn the drugs off, expecting your brain to just pop back and be perfectly fine is actually asking a lot. Yeah. So we probably have to work harder to do that. And, you know, coming up with strategies to turn the brain back on would be great. So now you have a strategy whereby what you're doing is you're monitoring exactly the dose of drug that you're giving and watching the response of the person on the EEG, the patient on the EEG, and then you're turning the brain back on. Those sorts of things right there alone, and that's not even changing any way, you know, sort of current level of technologies. So I think we can make a lot of progress doing that. And then going forward, I think we have to start thinking about designing drugs that target only the areas that need to be affected and leaving other areas alone, you know, site-specific anesthesia, if you would. Yeah. So so we think in terms of, in the other, any other areas where we're thinking about therapies, we think of, like, site-specific drugs to site-specific chemotherapeutic agents, for example. The same construct should be developed for 
anesthesia within the obviously a neuroscience you know paradigm. And if you're able to do that, you can imagine someone just being perfectly wide awake, having their brains turned off and turn right back on once the procedure is done, and then having their you know their brains work perfectly well, you know after the fact because you just turn on and off the areas that were relevant and you avoided the areas that are responsible for causing side effects. Yeah, it would be really interesting to see. Great. So I think all that's quite feasible, you know, yeah. and some of the earlier things that I mentioned, even shorter than, you know, five years, you know, two to three years, I think that's, I think that would be very, those ideas could be implemented and made, you know, brought to fruition quite, quite shortly and in short order. Thank you for listening to this NC Talks podcast from Neurology Central. For more podcasts, as well as to read exclusive interviews, journal articles and news, visit www.neurology-central.com.